I can see uh, people have started filtering in. Good morning, everyone. Um, if it's morning where you are, I'm aware that we've got uh, viewers all over the world for this uh, international conference, which is fantastic. Um, welcome to day two of the Cycling and Society Symposium. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Luke Wojciechowski. I work at the University of Salford as a researcher in the Healthy Active Cities team uh, with Graham Sheriff, who I'm sure you've, you've seen around for, the, um, for yesterday during the conference. Uh, I also work with um, Esther and Cosmin and Graham co-organizing the Cycling and Society Symposium. I'm going to be the chair of today's session, um, which is a focus on Greater Manchester from uh, the researcher perspective. The conference um, today has been organized by the Healthy Active Cities team of the University of Salford, as I mentioned, and the, and the Cycling and Society Support Committee. Uh, and today's first session to kick us off um, is going to start getting us thinking about a thread that I think is going to run through today in terms of a focus on Greater Manchester. Um, this first session is the first of two that are happening today, focusing on Greater Manchester particularly. The purpose of this session is to discuss cycling in Greater Manchester from a researcher's perspective, um, but it will be followed up with another session at 1.30 p.m. today. Uh, that will be led by Transport for Greater Manchester. And they're going to offer some policy reflections about the um, context of cycling in Greater Manchester. So we're going to um, look at the, the issue of cycling from researchers' perspective now, and later on we're going to come back to it with TFGM from the policy reflections. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not we complement each other. Let's uh, let's see how uh, let's see some of the themes that come up during this discussion. Um, originally, we wanted to invite you to Greater Manchester uh, to meet and socialise together and do some physical stuff and go on a cycle tour. But unfortunately, as we all know, with the case of the pandemic, this year's symposium has had to be online again, which has been a shame. But again, it allows us to access a more international audience, which is something we aren't always able to do um, when we do the symposiums in person. So that's been fantastic. Um, throughout the conference today, we've got uh, the University of Salford, University of Manchester and Manchester Metropolitan University represented from the greater Manchester context. Uh, we also, of course, have um, many other brilliant universities represented on panels throughout the day as well. But looking at that greater Manchester context, it's good to see that we've got three of the, um, three of the big universities in the area sort of represented. Um, and we're also going to be jo joined by Claire Stocks from the Greater Manchester uh, Campaign Walk Ride GM uh, in our closing session at 3.30 p.m. today. So we've got multiple strands of Greater Manchester focus taking place throughout many of the panels today, which is hopefully going to be, um, which is hopefully going to be really good. Um, I am going to pass things over now um, to the panel and I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves um, give a quick two to three minute introduction um, stating their name, the organisation they're attached to, some of their interests, um, their research interests, particularly in, in the context of Greater Manchester if they're able to, but also in the context of cycling sort of more broadly. Um, I have an order to go around and I am going to start with uh, Tracy. Um, Tracy, do you mind introducing yourself, please? Thanks, Luke. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tracy Farraher. I'm senior lecturer in healthcare sciences at the University of Manchester, but really I'm an epidemiologist. And my work is looking at using routine data to either reduce or understand health inequalities or find interventions that might reduce those inequalities. So in terms of cycling, we're looking at active transport and how we can make that more equitable and the health impacts that that has. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Tracy. That's, um, that's really interesting and a really nice starting point. I know some of the research we've been doing in um, with Healthy Active Cities has been looking at some of those familiar strands as well. And I think it's definitely something that's going to come back throughout the discussion this morning. Um, thank you for kicking us off. Um, could I now pass the floor over to Sharla? Sharla, are you happy to introduce yourself? Thank you, Luke. Um... My name is Chalar. I'm a lecturer in urban planning at the University of Manchester. 
and my research focuses on urban planning in general, but also how we can create places that are conducive to healthier lifestyles, as well as places that combat, tackle climate change. And cycling plays a very, very important role in terms of creating active lifestyles. That's, that's, a, very, that's a big tick for me from health inequalities perspective. It helps to reduce the carbon emission from, from, from passenger cars. That's not a big tick for me. I've also recently been looking at the impact of cycling on productivity and local economy. So that's also, again, something, something very, a very big area in terms of the cycling research. And I think that's it from me. Fantastic. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, yeah, that interest in active travel and all the benefits is um, one of the things that brought me to start so um, one, one of the things I think brought me and Graham together to set up Healthy Active Cities um, in the beginning and something that definitely runs through the core of our research as well, um, even as we look at different modes of transport. Um, I'm now going to pass things over to um, Nick Davis. I should mention that um, uh, we have had a slight change in the panel this morning. Unfortunately, one of the panelists who was um, planning to attend the session, Harry Larrington Spencer is unable to join us today. Um, um, but we've, uh, but Nick, Nick Davis from Glasgow Caledonian University has very kindly agreed to step in, and so I will now pass things over to Nick to introduce himself. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, I'm I'm Nick, and I'm a lecturer in tourism and events management at Glasgow Caledonian. Um, but I have got a, a quite a long background in cycle research. Um, particularly interested in in the mixture of modes so cycling and walking in in shared spaces um but also interested in the relationship between utility and leisure cycling as well so um people's habits people's motivations people's behavior um and how that kind of manifests manifests within these shared spaces um and in terms of research around manchester um i've done quite a lot of research with the healthy active cities teams on things such as e cargo bikes um the bike share scheme that was um that was that was in greater manchester in 2018 um and also some research around active travel in audsall around that that time as well um yeah that's it from me well, thanks nick um totally agree with um what you just said about the sort of the importance of the shared spaces and the um observing how all of these things interact is something that we've been looking at across various different research projects and something we're particularly looking at now in the context of e-scooters which i think graham's going to say a little bit more about in a moment before i pass things over to graham for an introduction um I've also just noticed Esther's mentioned in the chat and has also reminded me to say, please feel free to fire any questions over you have for any of the panel in the chat. If you can preface the questions with a, a cue and then uh, and even maybe if it's to someone specific, uh, maybe mention their name as well. And I will be pulling out these questions during the session today. So um, feel free to add your thoughts, your ideas, your questions, your sort of reflections, anything that might be on your mind, and we can get a little bit of a, uh, a discussion going between the panel and yourselves. I think that would be fantastic. Um, Graham, can I uh, ask you to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Graham Sheriff. I'm a research fellow at uh, University of Salford in the Healthy Active Cities team, and I've been working with with Luke and Nick here on the panel, and Harry, who's who's not here this morning, um, on various things around active travel in Salford, Greater Manchester, and beyond. Um, and one of the things we've been focused on, particularly recently, is kind of micro mobility uh, in the form of bike share, and more recently, e-scooters as part of the national trials that happen with e-scooters in the UK. Um, and I think the, the interesting thing for me with bike share is how it relates to cycling more generally. Um, and I know barriers is perhaps quite a simplistic term, but it kind of does the job for the moment. I, bike share helps to overcome some of the barriers to cycling because it gives people access to bikes. So we don't have to worry about storing them in our homes if we don't have room or about leaving bikes somewhere in, the, you know, and, and they might get stolen. So it, it helps with, with that barrier. It also gives people the opportunity to kind of try out a bike without, um, you know, an initial capital cost. 
However, it doesn't deal with issues such as traffic safety, which is the kind of number one barrier for people really to get in, to get going with cycling. And you know, in Greater Manchester, we're making some really good uh, progress with with our B network, but we're not there yet in terms of a, a city where everyone feels they can con you know confidently cycle on traffic free, traffic free or segregated separated routes. Um, we're also interested to see that bike share can add its own barriers. If you have a bike share system where the bikes, you know, aren't that great or the brakes don't work well or they're not well maintained, that um, that you know that that might give people a bad experience when they try cycling, so they may not continue. So I'm really hopeful that the new bike share system coming to Manchester later this year uh, will be will be good in that sense, um, and also that um, it can also sort of add barriers in the sense that if you're if you're concerned about looking around the city for a bike, you know, late at night or something, if you're relying on finding a bike, but you might have to spend some time looking for one that might have a personal safety implication. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be sort of borne in mind when thinking of it as part of a transport system. Um, and, and finally, it's that barrier of, you know, the physical barrier of, of sometimes, sadly, with the mobile scheme we had of, of bikes kind of being left on pavements, kind of in the way of road users or pavement users and making it less attractive to walk and cycles. That was another issue. With e-scooters, I'm sure we'll come back to you, but with e-scooters, it's that relationship with cycling that's really interesting. It's how do we plan space so we have room for cycling and some of the e-scooters and other micro-mobility modes we might see over the next few years. Um, and what, what do they mean in terms of public health? I mean, they're, 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 they're great in many ways. They bring people into, into a, a way of traveling that doesn't involve a car, perhaps, but also they're not as active as cycling. So what do they, we need to think about what they mean for public health. So that's, that's, uh, I'll leave that there and I hope we can come back to some of those issues in the, in the discussion. Brilliant, thanks Graham. I'm particularly interested in that big question about e-scooters and health. And, uh, and while it's not necessarily completely focused on cycling and do believe that there are parallels because of the potential shared space uh, challenges around these motor transport as well. And so I'm hoping maybe we can get into a little bit of that uh, soon. Uh, but last but not least, um, could I pass the floor over to James Woodland, uh, James Woodcock, please. Uh, thank, thanks, Luke. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm James. I'm redoing transport and health modelling at the MRC Epidemiology Unit, University of Cambridge. I've done quite a few different studies on cycling um, and the lead on the propensity to cycle tool that's uh, been used quite a bit in England and Wales. Uh, recently, we just published a, a paper comparing cycling rates and gender and age equity in cycling in many different countries and um, cities around the world. But most relevant to Greater Manchester, what we're doing now, quite a, a, a large team, many, many different collaborators from different places, we are um, developing an integrated model in which we are looking at the built environment measures, how these impact on travel behaviors and integrating that into a full uh, micro simulation agent based um, travel demands model. And then um, using, using a network assignment model, looking at you know, individual exposures uh, to levels of physical activity, um, air pollution, noise pollution, traffic in, in injury risk, and then running that through a, 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 health, a health model. And um, we are focusing on cycling infrastructure, 15 to, to, you know, to 20 minute cities, and uh, low traffic neighborhoods are some of the interventions that we're starting to, to look at. So we're very focused on trying to make sure the model works well for, for walking and for cycling. And um, the first place we're trying to develop this with um, help from the TFGM is in Greater Manchester. Uh, thanks, James. You'll definitely be interested to interesting to open up a little bit more of that, particularly in terms of the uh, low traffic neighbourhood stuff that's going on around here. Because I know I've been, I haven't been directly involved in any of that research, but I know a couple of my colleagues have, and I've been observing how it's been unfolding and seeing that through the lens of uh, all the modeling you've been doing would be, uh, I think it would be really interesting to find out a little bit more about. Um, but thanks to the panel for those introductions. Um, I think that's been really helpful. I think one of the strengths of this panel is from, you know, as you've just heard, we've got such a breadth of disciplines and subjects that are represented from health to urban planning, to inclusion, to walking, micromobility, modeling. Uh, and probably much more than that too. Um, 
I should also say that um, my one of my research interests um, is looking particularly at the use of cargo bikes for anyone who attended panel two yesterday probably might remember me from being as part of the panel sort of representing our research on e-cargo bikes and um, the potential for those vehicles to contribute to sort of sustainable transitions within urban congested centres as well. So I'm particularly interested always having the cargo bike hat on to see how it sort of relates to all the things that we've, we've heard so far today. Um, I suppose, okay, so first question to kick off with to the team, uh, to the panel. I'm always interested in I, I always think that the, the relationship that we have to our research is quite important, but I think it's also something that's often overlooked. Uh, we, you know, we tend to focus on some of the, the key findings of our research projects and things like that for obvious reasons at the time. But I do think that the personal relationship that we have to our research is something that sort of can be quite important in terms of what drives us to find, ask these questions, what drives us to sort of uncover this kind of data. So I'm gonna go around the panel with a fairly quick fire question. It doesn't have to be, um, you don't have to worry about going into too much stuff, but it'd be interesting to know about what drew you to this line of research in the first place, sort of what brought you to this, what brought you onto this path and uh, sort of inspired you to start asking these kind of questions. What would you say sort of drives you on the research journey uh, to find out more? Um, and to kick off with, I'll go around the uh, panel in a slightly different way this time. I will start with uh, Sharla, if that's okay. Yep, that's fine. So I am not what you call a, a, you know, a cyclist cyclist in, in inverted commas. I, I don't really like, a, I, I have a bike which cost me a hundred pounds, which I've been using for the last couple of years. My previous bike was even cheaper. I mean, I'm a utilitarian cyclist. I, this is my main mode of transport because it's cheap. And, and Manchester is a, is a flat city, so that's why I cycle. And I've been cycling or using cycling as a, my main mode of transport for the last, since 2016, I think, or 2015. And it just because at the time that, you know, increasing public transportation costs made me realize that how cheap cycling is. And then I start to realize how bad much of an experience cycling Greater Manchester, how bad drivers are, how bad the roads are, how bad the cycling infrastructure is. So from personal experience that seeing that and facing it every day made me realize, okay, there needs to be something done about this. And being an urban planner, my main focus, not just about cycling, but in general is to how we can make change, how we can engender change, whether it's through organizing committee groups and then putting pressure on the elected members in the, in the local government, or talking to the right people in the senior offices in the local government to make the change from, from top, or maybe a mixture of two. And this is how I kind of start interested in cycling in general. And then I start realizing you know, all the other benefits that I was getting out from cycling, that I was was fitter or at least I didn't get gain in weight I was saving money I started to be involved with the, a few different people in different communities I used to I started to go places that I never went before so it kind of expanded my my reach so to speak and and going to look at the different types of countryside of the park etc which I never had a chance to do it when I was in the public transportation or, or when I was walking so it's, it's this kind of this personal journey that made me realize the challenges the everyday cyclists such as myself face and the benefits the missed opportunities really that that, that help us to tackle climate crisis health inequalities and and again the productivity problem that we have in in northwest in greater manchester particularly so that's that kind of this personal journey that helped me to realize those those issues and a kind of push me towards that angle oh thanks charlotte that's great i i find that really interesting um going from that journey of getting a 100 pound bike because it's cheap in manchester's flat to then uncovering all of this other way of seeing the world around you and as a result becoming more engaged with your local community as well you know it's not just 
a mode of transport. It's also been a tool for you to access new spaces, meet new people, see new ways of, you know, think about new ways of seeing the place, which I guess must have then informed the way that you practice urban planning as well. And, um, you know, sort of gone on to create that chain of events. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Nick, could I uh, throw that question over to you and um, ask you sort of what drew you to sort of your line of research? Yeah, thanks very much, Luke. Um, it's going to seem really obvious, actually, but I like walking and cycling. Um, and so for a very long time, I've found ways of doing research um, around around those things, um, particularly um, my PhD was on walking tourism, which enabled me to go walking in the Lake District for 12 months. Um, that kind of thing is actually something that I enjoy doing. Um, but a lot of the issues as well relate to relate to cycling as well. Um, and in particular, one thing that's developed over, I'd say, the last few years, in my mind, is that there is a relationship between the experiences you have when you're doing something like that for recreation, for recreational purposes, or in a recreational space. So you can go on that holiday and go cycling and be cycling every day and enjoy it. But then you come back to your normal life in a city um, and do you then keep going with it? Or does it, is it the experience that actually might change people's behavior in the first place? Um, I'm very interested and have been very interested in sustainable behavior change, particularly for active travel um, for, for quite a long time. Um, and been involved in quite a lot of European projects on, on this um, around various cities. Um, and found in the past that, that it's very complex, obviously, but it's also what, what's going on in people's minds um, when they decide to change the way they travel, uh, particularly for commuting purposes, but also for leisure purposes as well. Um, and what I've found in the past is that, yeah, you can present them with health arguments, environment arguments, economic arguments. Um, usually it comes down to some kind of combination of the three. Um, sometimes it's the economic argument that wins out um, for a lot of people. And, and then you, you, you kind of start to think about inequalities in that respect. And, and that's kind of the kind of thing that's, that's um, guided me in, in, in where I look for research or how I design research, um, including the research I've done with you guys as well. Um, so yeah, really where I want to go with it is to, to, to carry on looking at this, this link between utility and leisure. I know from conversations with TFGM over the last few years that they're interested in things such as they spend lots of money on, on um, this is walking, but they spend lots of money on, on things like the walking festival, but then a lot of people don't go and then walk in their normal lives. Um, so what, what can be done to, to, um, to use those at recreational experiences to then transfer into everyday behavior. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of my, my, my thought process. That's where I'm at at the moment. And I suppose one last thing is that the, the COVID situation that's happened in the last 18 months, that's also, I'd say, uncovered a lot about people's habits, everyday habits, and, and having that time and space as well to go, to go out walking and cycling could potentially be you know another way of looking at the relationship yeah thanks nick uh, and i think you're absolutely right in, in connection to the way covid has changed the landscape and i have a question sort of around that um maybe for a little bit later um i also like how you just said you uh, you like walking and cycling so you research walking and cycling you know sometimes the uh, sometimes the answer hasn't got to be uh, super complicated um, Tracy, could I throw the question over to you about what sort of drew you to your line of research? Thanks, Luke. Um, I'm probably the one that's the latecomer to the cycling from COVID. Um, the, it was the opportunity that the roads were quiet. And I think it, it, that personal reason of um, was scared beforehand to go onto the roads um, and a bit lazy, probably. So, um, in terms of what how I got into cycling, um, I'm very much, it's still from a public health point of view that we keep looking at health inequalities. And for the last few decades, we've been very bad at reducing those inequalities because we've concentrated on individual behavior. 
we've told people what to do. We've shook our fingers at people and said you should drink less, do more exercise, stop smoking. And that the interventions that we've been doing may actually have increased inequalities because we're not targeting them to specific groups and we end up um, helping the worried well and the less deprived to change their behaviours. And so I think the transport and cycling in particular is a good example where we can make structural changes and multiple changes to make that difference, to make it as easy as possible for people to get out of their cars. Because that's really the broader message is may it be cycling, may it be walking, may it be public transport, it's to get people out of their cars. So it, it, I'm coming up from a, a more population perspective than an individual because I'm a really late cyclist. Thanks, Tracy. That's the, I mean, it's great that you're coming at it from that particular perspective. I think it offers a, a whole new way of looking at things for me as well, for someone who doesn't, you know, do, doesn't tend to do research in this particular area. I also like that you've come to cycling sort of from through COVID. I think that's, uh, that's a particularly interesting thing to pick up on. I think there'll be a lot of people that that's and it's trying to keep people to do it as well I think would be um, one of the messages is you may may have been bitten by the bug and it's keeping people involved mm. yeah absolutely um, I can see a question coming in on the chat which I'll come to in a moment I think but uh, feel free everyone to throw some ideas and some reflections so far, some questions into the chat. Uh, it's a little bit unusually quiet at the moment and maybe we're all on our second coffee of the day. Maybe that'll help us move things along, but uh, it'd be great to see that chat getting a little bit busier and, and seeing a little bit of interaction between the panel and the audience. Um, James, can I throw the question over to you uh, about sort of what drew you to your area? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in a cup of, I mean, I think many of the things would follow on from what Tracy had said. I mean, I'm also, you know, contrained as, as, as an epidemiologist and this kind of focus on the, the upstream determinants of population health. And again, I, I, I think I started more from seeing the harms of the car than, you know, from the merits of cycling. Um, you know, I, and I, I would say this is both, you know, my kind of, you know, scientific and wider understanding of the harms of the car-based society, the car-based economy, and, you know, even at the, the higher level of the kind of geopolitical, the, you know, I, I started doing, you know, research in, the, in, in this area around the kind of in, invasion of Iraq and, you know, the links to um, oil, oil dependency. But then, at the very, you know, the kind of, at the other level, just in terms of livable cities, just you know, thinking about what makes a city nice, what makes environments environments pleasant, and you know, just the scourge of uh, of you know the the cars <laughs> or, 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 or on you know you, you, human interaction on on on, on human livability on, on just cities that that minimise this are just generally so much more pleasant than that than, than than cities that you know let let, let it kind of run uh, rampant and. Um, you know, in in fringe on, on on the way people you know go go about their lives and what supposedly kind of something that liberates and provides opportunities, you know, at the same time acts very much as as, as a barrier um, to and a, a deterrent to people realizing and achieving many of the th the things that they want to do, with particular you know in increases um, inequalities and in the you know the level of kind of stress and attention that's needed to um, operate safely as a pedestrian or as a cyclist within within that environment and you know I like models as then as a way of you know evidence synthesis way of bringing together all the different things from different air, from, from different areas different kinds of research different kinds of studies and then you know you using that as an opportunity to you know to to, to integrate to, to to simulate uh, and to and to to look at what might what what might happen and give you this kind of you know virtual environment in which you can play around with it, play around with these things and understand how things may be linked in ways that people hadn't considered so far 
Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for explaining that. Uh, I like how you mentioned you sort of came at it from the aspect of seeing the harms of the car rather than the merits of the bicycle uh, to begin with. I think that's, uh, that's a really sort of interesting, really interesting and nice phrase to use. Um, Graham, can I quickly just pass, pass this over to you and then we'll um, sort of start looking at some of the questions that are coming in. Yeah, thanks, Luke. And um, yeah, I would say actually, similar to James, I came at this from a kind of environmentalist point of view originally, from you know, the harms of the car rather than the merits of the bike. And I was personally getting around on buses and trains, and um, cycling was one of those things I always thought I should give it a try. And I wasn't, you know, I'm not a particularly sporty person. It always seemed like maybe it was quite a difficult thing to do. And you know, probably I don't know, 15 years ago, I, I gave it a try, and it was great. And I, you know, found it. I, I, I also found you don't have to be sporty to cycle. I think that was that was what was important, really. I, 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 all those associations I had, they didn't really apply. So it was a, actually a great way to get around. And now I still use buses and trains, but probably jump on my bike for you know most local journeys. Um, and I guess starting from that environmental point of view, I became much more interested in the kind of social side of it, really, in in terms of social inclusion and realised that, um, you know, not only do do people feel excluded from cycling because cycling is still you know it's it's a certain population who do most of the cycling certainly in greater manchester and i am hoping i hope that's changing um but you know we we, we should be open out to more people so they can enjoy the benefits of it really see a very positive a positive way of all those those health and economics and personal benefits that, that other panelists have mentioned and then also that that then opens up so much else that it's not just about enjoying cycling but it's having cycling as that thing that connect you to all the other things so you can you can get to jobs you might not be able to get to otherwise or education opportunities or you know visit friends that might otherwise be five bus journeys or so you know for example so yeah it's just coming at it from a kind of environmental point of view but then increasingly seeing it as this is a, a really important social thing for I think someone else said you know for livable cities yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Graham. I think that's interesting. That's been a little bit of a thread that sort of comes through most people's re most people's sort of reasoning. Really, is starting out from that environmental perspective and then discovering the sort of social and and, and, and community sort of relations and benefits attached to all that as well. Um, I can see some questions coming in, which is fantastic. Um, I have one from Esther towards the entire panel, which I think is a particularly interesting one, and I'll just open this out to the floor. So. Whoever would like to answer, either just raise your hand on Zoom or um, jump in and uh, we can see how we go. But the question from Esther says, many of us consider um, ourselves cycling activists and researchers, um, and it's not always an easy thing to balance, sort of representing an organisation, but then also trying to campaign or, or, or sort of battle for um, change on the ground through activism. Um, Esther's curious to know if the panelists find themselves in this situation, and if so, how they manage it, or what some of the challenges involved in that process are. Um, so, James, I can see your hand's gone up. Would you like to? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just give my two pence worth here. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly understand the, the, the challenge that, that is here. I mean, I, I think that we research is best done when you have an engagement. I mean, and, you know, public health research, in a sense, always, it, 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 it's always nor normative, not, not kind of po positive, you know, kind of research it, it, um, as, you know, we want to improve population health. I mean, that's a, that, that's a starting point. We have, we have things, that we, we see that as a good thing that we are, we are trying to achieve. Um, I mean, I think, you know, all researchers have biases, they have their own personal opinion, they have their, you know, class, racial, you know, background and, 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 and so, so on that, that they come from. And, I, you know, we can't avoid that. Um, the, po the point is to try and, you know, be reflective uh, 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 and understand where you, where you are coming from and, what the, and, and how, what, how that affects how you do research. And you know, of course, to be rigorous and reproducible in the in the methods methods that, that you use. I mean, it's not about you know not having an an, an, an opinion. It's it's science is about is is about doing the method the methods in that in that way. And you know, I mean, something like the the propensity to cycle talk. I think you know our engagement in the cycling community and our understanding of the the issues and the needs led to. Um, as getting uh, you know this contract with the Department for Transport, and, and from there, what was what was intended as a um, a policy tool, what is a policy tool, 
we we then as 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 researchers as academics use this as a kind of springboard to do to do further advanced yeah re research so you know i i, I think that, that these things can can be um that can be complementary and it, it, you know it, it can work well together you, you you just need to it's, it's always just a, ma a matter of kind of trying to stay, take a, a step back as you as you take a step forward and keep an eye on yourself thanks james that's that's really interesting the uh you've reminded me as well that this um that uh, the importance between sort of balancing those two worlds can, you know, can be quite challenging. Research is guided by objective science a lot of the time. So you sort of want you to stick on that path. It's so, you know, you, you, you shouldn't hopefully wander too far off, but um, having that sort of guiding momentum within you, you know, always sort of helps and always helps to move you forward. Um, I'm going to move over to Sharla because I can see he's got his hand up. Um, what I would ask them if possible, Sharla, uh, is if we, if, if you're happy to answer this question and maybe just bring in a bit of context within Greater Manchester or Manchester more locally, if that's okay, because I know that uh, you are involved in a lot of things going on around the Manchester area. Yeah, happy to do it. What prompted me to actually raise my hand and, and is that what James said that the, the public health starting point is normative that we should improve public health. And coming from urban planning, we have a, a we have a, a very interesting position that our job is to improve or deliver a public service for for everyone to use is to deliver public goods, but also enable sustainable development. So the question is always quite interesting within you know, urban planning circles: is that what if they don't? What if they conflict? How are you going to reconcile? I mean, people want to drive. So am I supposed to design cities that, you know, easier to drive? Am I supposed to put more motorways everywhere so people can drive everywhere? Or do I actually understand that there's, there's a need to, to tackle that there's a climate change, there are people that, you know, find driving either stressful or cannot afford it because driving a car is, owning a car is not, a, is, is not cheap, it's quite actually, uh, an expensive outgoing and so how do you reconcile this so i think the planning has a more constructive more bottom-up aims that you know to trying to address the what local communities want and in the greater manchester context certainly that's why i was going to say as well is that that's the biggest challenge you find ourselves in our research projects is that how do you tackle this this conflict how do you reconcile this that there are group of people that who can't drive because it's costly, there are people who want to cycle and they have certain demands from, from urban planning perspective in terms of how the, the place should look like, where the roads or cycle lanes should be, and how do you reconcile this with people who need to drive for whatever reason or wants to drive? Do I going to cave in and say, yes, we're going to put motorways because you are the ones actually voting for those elected members who are making those decisions or you know, how do you find the solution? Because I'm in, not pos I'm in no position to tell either way because that's not what the urban planners do. And in Great Manchester, one of the key challenges we found ourselves is that always tackling car parking. Whenever we want to do a, a cycle scheme, whenever we want to do create design intervention, either for the car, uh, net zero, I mean, change or health nickels or productivity, car parking is always a key issue. Right? You talk about evidence, we talk about you know, the community groups and everything, but it comes down to always car parking. People say, okay, this great plan, what's going to happen to car parking? And I'm just thinking, is this what it's about? Is this what we come down to the 21st century in the UK, that everything is about car parking? And it's, I mean, you, you laugh, but honestly, you talk to elected members and they say, well, car parking is important because their constituents love it, because they can park their cars wherever they want, and it brings huge amounts of revenue for them. So the local governments love it. Some constituents love it because, it's, you know, they, they feel that they need to be able to park their cars somewhere. And that also enables them to be active because they can travel, they can, they can go to their work. So some people might feel like they they are forced to own the car. So that's, and they will, they need to be able to park somewhere. And if you talk to other people, then it's car parking space. It's just an empty space 
occupied by this metal box for which not being going to be used for maybe number of hours during the day. And then you think it's, it's again a missed opportunity that space could have been given to, you know, children to play or, you know, a cycle parking space or a green space, if we can assemble those spaces together or, or housing, which again helps bring down the house prices down. So that's, that's what comes down to car parking is a very alive issue in Greater Manchester. And when we talk to senior members in the council or people in the, in the, in the, in the local government, they're often quite receptive to the idea that we should tackle this. The ch challenge has been that how, what we should do. We, we always bring, down, bring the example of what's happening in London. And they say, well, it's London, you can't do it. We, we say, well, they do it in Amsterdam, they do it in Copenhagen and other places in Europe. They say, well, it's Amsterdam. We do, the, we do things differently in Manchester. So we can't do Amsterdam, it has to be different. Okay, then there are examples in Bristol. There are examples in Leeds. There's examples in small market towns in, in Northwest. There's examples in Preston. So what about those places? Well, no, Manchester or Greater Manchester is different. So there, there are unique challenges associated with Greater Manchester. We have this big conurbanation city region com combines the Manchester, Salford, so Salford and South Trafford, but also we have a quite big chunks of rural, well, not rural, but countryside, commuter towns where people travel into Manchester. So there is this quite big tension between quite a lot of different groups and main challenge has been for us to how do you find solutions that might satisfy or at least not make people angry that you know that we can we can roll out and car parking again it comes down to unfortunately in great manchester so if we can find a solution to that that's a million dollar price thing then you'll you'll, you'll be golden but yeah that's that's my experience thanks charlotte and that's uh I think that was uh, laying down the gauntlet to the audience there, the million dollar question. If we can find an answer to that, uh, then uh, we can, we can, I'm sure, claim impact for this uh, symposium today. Um, I've just seen uh, that um, I think Graham wants to jump in, uh, but is unable to put his hand up on Zoom at the moment. So Graham, would you like to say something? Thanks. I don't seem to have a Zoom option to raise my hand. That may be intentional. I'm not sure. But um, sorry, just, just really quick on this question. I think I agree with what, what's being said, but um, and um, I think it's it's really good. I think that, that cycling researchers are so often plugged into decision making and activism. It's it's really healthy. And it's so good that we're often out on the road cycling, you know, because we, we experience it. We know what it's about. But I also think we should be careful that we don't end up in a kind of bubble that we just assume that it's just normal, that people cycle, that this is easy, that that you know we have to remember that for certainly in greater manchester anyway for most people don't don't cycle and it's something quite kind of foreign you know it's something quite unfamiliar to them and i was reading through some interview notes this morning just to, to refresh myself and um one of our interviews about e-scooters and, and the, the quote was simply i wouldn't voluntarily uh, cycle across salford um and for most of the people i mean there are people who voluntarily cycle across salford and that's great but we have to remember that for most people um it's still something that you know they 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 need you know, extra, um, they need to be given the confidence to do that. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Um, I can see the chat is lighting up, which is fantastic. And I can see that uh, there's been a couple of questions uh, for Tracy that she's addressed in the chat directly, which is great. But it's also got me thinking a little bit more broadly about one of the questions you were asked from Vera about um seeing the momentum from the pandemic to move active health policies more into action and i suppose this is something that we've all been looking at and thinking about as researchers over the last 18 months particularly with the shock to the system that has been covid19 and how we have seen so much change uh short term or perhaps long term uh, we're yet to see conclusively on that uh, around active travel um i suppose my question that I'd like to sort of re reiterate or, or build upon from what, v what Vera asked um, Tracy um, after Tracy mentioned, uh, responded in the chat is sort of, what would we say some of the key lessons have been that we've learned from the disruption of COVID-19 in regards to active travel, particularly cycling in Greater Manchester? Sort of what are those sort of key observations that we've noticed, you know, maybe from the very early days of the first lockdown all the way through to the, 27th lockdown I've lost I've lost memory now of how many we've had over time 
Um, I'll open that question to the floor if anyone would like to put their hand up to sort of take it first. Anything comes to mind? So if no, it's, no, no volunteers, because I will point the finger if there are no volunteers. Um, Khan, I'll, I'll throw this over to, to, to Nick. Um, is there anything that you've sort of noticed over the last 18 months, Nick? Yeah, I mean, I've seen research um, not in the last couple of months, actually, since the most recent opening up episode. But there was there was obviously I think we've all seen this with our own eyes. There was an initial first lockdown, massive reduction in car travel around every city and around every area, um, uh, which was lasted for about six weeks or so. And people started to get out on their bikes. There was a temporary pop up cycle lanes. Um, people who weren't cycling previously were, were finding it um, the confidence to be able to, to go out on the roads um, and start to realize that they enjoyed cycling as well. Um, and this was just in the context of everyday exercise um, rather than having to get from A to B. Um, then we saw um, a slight rise as things started to open up in the first lockdown we saw slight rises in in car traffic until it got to a point where it almost well it is back to normal it's gone back to normal um now it's it feels like covid never happened in some ways if you look at the roads um and what's that meant for the cyclists I, i've not got data like as i said for the most recent lockdown or i've not looked at any data recently but i imagine that yes you may have that residue of Cyclists that picked it up again in the in the first lockdown, who have built it into their lives, as Tracy was saying, she's she's done something similar. Um, but you know, it's it's still very dangerous. It's still there's still all of the issues that were there previously. So I think I think that that's that's pessimistic. But I think optimistically, um, in terms of cultural awareness of cycling and in terms of the way that people think about it now, there's, there's been a definite change. Um, and a lot more people are aware of it and aware of it as an option. So it's how, how then do we apply that to this kind of bigger picture? Um, and a lot of the things have already been said in answers to previous questions from the panelists um, in terms of the urban design and in terms of, in terms of placemaking and in terms of messaging as well. So, so healthy messaging. Um, and it's probably looking at how we can we can best um, jump on this this wave and and start to change things as we've always wanted to anyway you know, without COVID we've always wanted to do this as cycle researchers um, so yeah I think that you know it, there is a there is a reason for optimism. Yeah, thank you Nick. Uh, I can see Tracy's put her hand up. Tracy would you like to jump in? There's always one person who doesn't unmute, and that would be me. Um, I, there's somebody, I think Adam as well, wanted to put, raised his hand. Um, I, I think there's this definite benefit now that people are much more aware of thinking about inequalities in health and the environment. I think that's what we've seen from the pandemic is that is the consequences of inequalities. And I think there's an opportunity there to use that in terms of policy changes um, and working with people like Greater Manchester to change policies that reflect that changing mood. Um, but I, and then that has a consequences to individuals circumstances and what they would do um i haven't got an answer i just think there's an opportunity there that we might well have um more of a say than we did before yeah, thank you um that yeah that builds on what nick was saying really about that perception change that we've seen even though maybe the numbers went up and then maybe they they, they the, the, the increase is not yeah. necessarily accepted I think, but. yeah, I think more from not the individual choice to cycle, but also from policymakers mm. may have changed their the pressure on them to do things 
might be more than what they had previously. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, I can see that Adam Reynolds has got his hand up. Um, so um, I, I'd like to invite Adam to, um, to, to come in with either a question or a, maybe a comment or a reflection. I, I, think, I think the thing is, is I think um, what's changed from a point of view, um, I've been campaigning and worked since 2013 in, in the space. And there have been some you know, years when the local council has allocated 4,000 pounds for the whole year for uh, cycling infrastructure. And the difference now is, is that we have a, a, a strong set of standards. They can be slightly circumvented. But more importantly is every year a council is getting 500, half a million, a million pounds, two million, three million pounds worth of money given to them and told build stuff with it to these standards. And that from a polit political point of view, the control has always been in the budget. So you can either have a really good um, team, officer team, who recognize, say, the Cycle City Ambition Grant coming up, put a bid in for that. I mean, we built, yeah, we put a bid in on the second ones and it was undersubscribed. So we got all the money. We got, we didn't expect to get 3.8 million pounds. We got 3.8 million pounds because 27 million pounds was returned back to the DFT because they didn't have enough people doing it. It was a two week bid window. And now every year, here's another 200, is it 257 this year? So that's, um, million pounds that councils must spend and a lot of them are fighting it massively and trying to damn this to get around it and you're seeing the kind of the network the network management duty changes that are coming in to legally force councils to actually do this stuff and they're desperately trying not to deliver cycle infrastructure a lot of them and getting now financially punished for it and i think this is the this, this is the dynamic that's changed here for a long time we've begged and begged and begged and now since the Active Travel Fund, it's a demand that we can place upon councils and say, you now have a legal duty to spend this money in a good way. And if you don't, you will find your pothole money going. Yeah, you'll have massive political implications down the line. And councillors are, are having to adjust to this new reality. And you're getting into this type of the all powerful cycle lobby. It's not that. There's just money in this space now that just wasn't there. And that's completely changed the dynamic. Oh, thank you, Adam. That's a that's a really great contribution and a bit of a, a bit of a call to action um, for us all to to be more mindful about the resources that are available out there and how we can sort of encourage more um, engagement with it from policymakers and decision makers. I'm uh, looking at the time and I can see that we've got five minutes to go. So I think for the remainder of this session, I'm going to ask the panel um, a question around. Um, what they would say some of the key priorities for their future research moving forward are looking like and if you know particularly in the context of Greater Manchester and cycling if possible um, I'm going to try and be ambitious and say if we can maybe just try and keep to maybe a minute or so each and then hopefully we'll finish exactly on time which would be nice uh, so we'll see how we go um, could I invite James to come in first on this one Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> very, very small, very, very, very quickly, or very, very few of the. Um, I think da data. I mean, for for, for me, um, on the, the the quality of and aspects of the environment. I mean, we, uh, Greater Manchester has you know pretty good data. It has good data on um, yeah from travel survey data. You could data on the kind of site, site, cycling infrastructure, but if you if you look at you know Open Street Map, if you think about the available data sources that are consistent across the country, there is really um, there's a real there's a real weakness in terms of our you know under understanding of um, the environments in which people walk, the environments in, in, in which they cycle, and certainly so doing that in a consistent way and. and um, you know the exposure to green space and so on, and me methods are improving on this massively with with satellite data, with with machine learning. Um, but we also we need to um, integrate that with detailed um, behavioural data, which you know we're often still getting from you know individual level surveys, but can in some cases be got from um, newer technologies, um, you know mo mobile apps, 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 and uh, uh, and, and so on. Yeah. Thank you, James. Uh, Graham, can I ask you to come in? 
Thanks. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, really having a good set of data about what, you know, what's happening in cycling is so important. And for me, I think it's that moving from simply getting more people cycling, which feels like what we're often talking about, um, to really diversifying that group of people. So we know it's not just more people, it's a diverse group of people who are cycling, including uh, thinking about, you know, how inclusive are we being in terms of disabled people, in terms of gender, ethnicity, income, um, and I think that requires that really good understanding of, of you know, really good data set that's also qualitative. So it's really understanding if people who, who, who isn't cycling and understanding why not and what, what we can do to make cycling more appealing. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Charlotte, can I ask you to come in at this point? Thank you, look, well, I had flashbacks going back to my line manager asking the same question, what's my next, plans for my next five year research plans, what, what I'm supposed to do. Um, I think I have a counter argument. I don't, I, I don't say agree that data is not important and we should have more of it and more hyper local data, not just around the greater mercy, but we should have, we, should, we need data at the smallest spatial scale if possible to make us more informed judgments about the impact of cycling or, or any interventions on, on, on neighborhoods or certain certain demographics and certain groups of people. But I think what we need more is also stories, narratives that, that convince people, then tell people that why, why we need to cycle more for, for ourselves, for, for the planet, for, for local economy, for regional inequalities. I think we have enough data as is now to, to make a strong case, but it's still not happening as fast as, fast as it should. I just remember the Extinction, Extinction Rebellion protest back in 2018, which pushed the whole conversation around climate change to a level that we never seen before in this country. And that kind of caused all councils to declare climate emergency. It's, it, it wasn't just the Extinction Rebellion, there is also a generational shift and there's a whole idea of the climate crisis and the, the conversation is changing. And I think what we need next is better stories. This could be anecdotal evidence from people or, or a better way of telling the stories. I don't know, I don't have the answer as of yet what it might look like but we have convincing stories because we are changing for, for the better. I think we are progressing. I think we are on the right path, but I think it's not happening as fast as it should to tackle these inequalities that Tracy was mentioning and the, and the, the, and the climate crisis. And I think that's the main challenge here for us. Yeah. And as researchers, I think, that's something that we should be looking at definitely. How can we create better stories, convincing stories for elected members, for general public, for politicians, and for for the you know for the by the by the public. Thanks, Shara. Um, I, I really like the I really like the point of stories and that human connection to to, to the data, finding ways of getting people to engage with it in that way. And I am. Um, Sorry for summoning flashbacks of your line manager as well. That wasn't my intention there when asking, when asking the question. Um, I've noticed the time, we're one minute over, so I officially apologise that I have failed you all as a chair, but I would like to um, just hear finally um, from Tracy and Nick. So um, Tracy, could I ask you to come in uh, quickly and have a give, yeah, give us your thoughts on priorities for your research moving forward? Um, yes to everything that everybody else has said. Um, in terms of priorities, one aspect would be to understand the decision making process of policymakers, because what they do will make a difference to who takes up cycling in the future and keeps it up. So I'd, I'll just leave it at that. And thank you for the session. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tracy. And um, Nick, can I ask you finally to come in? Yeah, I mean, I mean similarly, policy. Um, we, we've got policy for health. We've got policy for sport activity. We've got policy for transport. How can we make all of these things that are working towards the same aim, fundamentally about getting people onto bikes and walking? Um, how can we make them more than the sum of their parts? Um, how can we understand that um, 
that that level of confidence that people have felt recently to go out and and cycle more how can we maximize on how can we maximize that with policy that's Fantastic. it Thanks, Nick. Well, a big thank you from me um, to all of the panel members this morning. I think that's, that's been a really interesting session for me, and I've really enjoyed hearing from all of you. Um, can I just bring up, ask someone to go slide one more time for the schedule for the remainder of the day? Um, just to point out that I, um, what I heard there was um, a lot of policy, policy, policy moving forward, which is great. And I'd like to draw your attention to um the, the session we have at 1 30 which again is another focus on greater manchester session but from the policy reflections of transport for greater manchester i've seen some questions and comments being coming into the chat that we haven't been able to um address this morning but please hold that energy hold that momentum keep those ideas bring it back to that session at 1 30 and really hope we can continue the discussion with um, some of the people involved in making some of those decisions around Greater Manchester. So I think that would be um, that would be really good. But in the meantime, thank you all for attending this session. And our next session is at 11.30 in half an hour, um, panel five, which is going to look at electric and shared mobility. Um, but once again, a big thank you to the panel um, for your time and your thoughts this morning. And thank you to an audience for um, yeah, listening and staying in touch. And we'll hopefully see you for our next session. Thank you very much.